there are two considerations. Yeah, definitely. You want to keep your costs down, but you also like, you just don't have room for it. When we were living in the tiny house, it was the rule pretty much was one thing in one thing out. If I wanted to buy a new mm. coat, I had to get rid of something. Uh, Cause we only had so many hooks and we only have so mm. many hangers. Um, so that was one, one thing I had to get my head around, but it was actually really freeing, which it's just, it's just like any habit that you develop. Um, you just practice. And once you get it down, it's just really nice. Not even thinking like when you go into a store, you're not even like, this doesn't apply to me. Everything, all like the decoration-y stuff that you see at stores mm-hmm. and the paintings and the tchotchkes and the fake plants, it just didn't apply to me because I literally mm-hmm. just had no room. My house was designed to decorate it as it is. And if I wanted to change something, everything would have to change. So I just didn't right. even want to go there. Welcome to another episode of What's Up With DJ, and I'm your host, DJ. And each week, I bring you topics about current events, career development, finance, holistic living, life hacks, and stories of inspiration and humor, all from a spiritual perspective. So for the entire month of February, in celebration of African American History Month, I've been showcasing African American authors. And this week, the author is Corey Ann Holmes, and we are focusing on her book, South Island Tiny House, which chronicles her journey from Boston to New Zealand with her husband. They both committed to building a 14 square meter tiny home. Folks, that's smaller than the average size parking space. <laughs> but Um, They committed to doing that because they wanted to gain financial freedom. What some people are calling the FIRE movement, which means financial independence, retire early. So we'll talk about that this week. But next week, join me because we'll be discussing tiny home living again with author V.V. Ty. And we'll learn about what she calls van life. And yes, she lives out of a vintage Dodge van. (laughs) But V, she helps um, her clients find their personal path to freedom. And she teaches people how to live a more authentic life. And through Reiki and meditation, and we'll dive into her story next week. But this fire movement has really taken off. So, um, yeah. So, but be sure to subscribe, follow, like, comment, and leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Your thoughts, opinions, comments are always encouraged and appreciated. You can always email me at dj at whatsupwithdj.com. Again, that's dj at whatsupwithdj.com. And with that being said, let's get right into the show. So... My guest this week is Corey Ann Holmes. She's the author of South Island Tiny House. Corey Ann currently resides in Dunedin, New Zealand with her husband, Patrick. She is originally from Boston where she met her husband. Corey Ann graduated from Wesley College where she majored in French and East Asian studies and earned her master's degree in business management from the University of Canterbury. After a few months of dating, Corianne is actually the one who popped the question. Will you move with me to New Zealand? I bet you thought I was going to say, will you marry me? But they married in 2017. They moved to New Zealand in 2014 and decided to use their life savings to build a tiny house for just $13,600, which they lived in for five years. The tiny house allowed them to save enough to build a normal size home, mortgage free, overlooking the beautiful Blue Skin Bay, which is extremely beautiful, located in Watati, which is a small town outside of Dunedin. They recently quit their jobs to run their multiple businesses together. You can find more about their journey on their YouTube channel, which I will have in the description notes. 
they currently have their South Allen tiny home listed on Airbnb for others to experience tiny home living. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited. Yes, I'm so glad to have you on. So this month, I am inviting um, African-American authors for the month of February, which is African-American, um, African-American History Month. And I saw that uh, you was African-American and uh, you was an author. And also that you lived in New Zealand and you were an author of, you know, you was doing um, minimalistic living, you know, tiny home living, a.k.a. tiny home living. And I thought, oh, that must be so interesting. We have an interesting conversation. We have such an interesting conversation. Mm-hmm. So I reached out to you and said, yes, I'll be on your show. <laughs> yeah. So thank you for being here. And I just wanted to uh, just get an understanding about what is tiny home living. Because I've seen, you know, footage, uh, videos of people on um, YouTube. But what is your definition of it? Well, you know, that's the thing is tiny house living is really so personal and everyone has a little bit of a different journey and how they arrive to the decision that tiny house living was for them. Um, but for us, we basically defined it as a small home, whether that means um, on wheels, which our house is, ours is a tiny house on wheels, um, or a little bit more permanent, so either built on a foundation or on um, piles, for example, um, or it could be something like a contain- a shipping container size. Um, so it really depends on where you live, what kind of situation you have, like even living on a boat, I consider that to be tiny house living, or mm-hmm. living in a uh, house, uh, house bus or a van life kind of situation yeah um yeah yeah. so basically it's just anything where you stay in a contained very small sized home um for whatever reason and there's lots of reasons that people do it but for us it was mostly to um live in a dry home um we wanted a place where we were allowed to have a cat so the the property we were renting um didn't allow cats and we kind of adopted this stray cat. So we wanted to make sure we could keep her with us. And Mm -hmm. also we just wanted um, a place that didn't have so much um, high rental cost, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, So those were our our three main things and the three main reasons we decided to go tiny. Yeah, you know, usually when people think about moving to uh, a new location to um, save money, they don't expand that search you know, worldwide. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I like that, you know, you're like, okay, let me, let me take all my options. Yes. So, um, so what, what, and I know that it's a, it's a, um, a word that I've heard often, um, especially amongst my millennial friends is the fire movement, which stands for financial independence, retire early. Did this have anything to play in the reason why you chose the tiny home route? Yes, absolutely. Um, So the FIRE movement is an interesting movement because it's kind of really just gotten really big with my generation. Um, And I think of it in like two parts, almost two stages. So the financial independence part was the part that was most um, important to us when we were looking at moving to New Zealand. Um, We were both working pretty average jobs. We both had an apartment to ourselves. My husband had... Yeah, so he was renting with his twin brother. So he had a roommate and I was living alone, but it was just, it wasn't, we had been doing that for, you know, I had been working for about two years outside of university and I could just see where my life was headed and it didn't really excite me at all. Um, I didn't see a huge amount of career growth in uh, the industry that I was working in at the time. And it just, the East Coast had lost its luster um, mm-hmm. when I had first gotten there when I was, you know, 18, going to college, living the college life in Boston, because there's so many universities, so many colleges. Um, it was just super fun. And then after you start working, you're like, do I really want to stay here? Mm-hmm. Um, so we, you know, we just started talking. We're like, how do we make sure that we have that financial independence where we're not dependent on a place, where we're not dependent on a job? Um, to be able to do the things that we want. So that's why we started saving. And that's why we started looking to New Zealand. We thought that we'd have a better 
first of all, work-life balance, um, but also some other financial considerations. There's a lot more holiday that you can take um, mm-hmm. here in New Zealand, get a lot more leave. Um, healthcare, you don't have to pay out of pocket for. My husband was just killing himself over it because mm. at least I had really good healthcare with my job, but his was just year after year after year, they would take something away. They took away dental. Then they took away, you know, they the price went up for his healthcare and it was just, he just couldn't see he couldn't see, you know, the, the tree, the forest for the trees. So yeah. those were, those were some of the considerations we also made um, that would help us with our bottom line. Um, plus we were young, we wanted an adventure. So mm. those were, those were the main things to get to the financial independence part and the retire early part. Um, you know how, uh, how us black people love to uh, remix things. Mm-hmm play on things when it comes to music or arts, culture, anything. Um, we always do things with our own little twist. So the retire early part, I don't really see the the um, the allure of retiring early. Yeah. Um, if you love actually, what you do, if you love what you do, then it's not so alluring. But if you hate what you do. Exactly. Or you just see it as a job, then it's, it's, it's going to interpret it differently. Absolutely. Absolutely. And if you think about it, really rich people never retire anyway. Like, you know, Warren Buffett, the Queen Mm. of England. Like, if you're (laughs) rich, you never stop because you want to keep a hold of your money. You want to influence the next generation in some way. Um, And I mean, sure, when you're rich and old, you maybe play more golf, but you're still meeting with your lawyers. You're still meeting with your accountants. Mm -hmm. You're still investing in businesses, managing your hedge fund. You know, that Mm -hmm. is what I consider to still be work. Um, So our intention was never to stop working completely because most people in our generation don't expect to be able to stop working completely. So we Mm -hmm. figured why not put ourselves in a position where we can investigate what we want to do, what we feel passionate about doing. And that's why I wrote this book because Mm -hmm. um, that's something that you can do forever. I mean, that's, Mm -hmm. that's not dependent on my body still being able to work as opposed to, I don't know, being a gardener for when you're 90, that's kind of, yeah, that that, that doesn't sound (laughs) good at all. You know, so like. so so what was your life like? So, you know, you're 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 young and you're in Boston. You um, have graduated from college. Mm-hmm. Um, you're dating Patrick. Mm-hmm. So what was going on at that particular time when you start thinking about these things? Mm-hmm. So um, I was working for a nonprofit that was pretty small. Um, I loved my job, but it was basically like. The, the whole process was they'd get early graduates to do maybe a year, maybe two years working for them. And then they'd cycle them out because there wasn't much growth. There was, there was kind of like a gap of that middle management where you could really become a manager and, and gain more skills. So um, I figured that maybe my best option would be to uh, upskill to get a um, higher degree. Um, so then when I started looking at programs, um, I, I was just shocked. I'm very fortunate. My parents were able to pay for my college experience. So I wasn't yeah, really, I was kind of naive when it came to how much higher education really actually costs in the United States. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, especially once you get your master's degree, like my mom would always tell me growing up, like, make sure that you, if you can try to get a job that'll pay for <laughs> Your yeah, that's true. Program, if you can do it, um, that pretty much doesn't exist anymore. I'd say maybe her mm-hmm. generation might might have been the last one to uh, benefit from that little right. perk. Um, so I started looking at prices, and I'm like, eh, no, no, I don't want to get into any more debt. Any, any more debt? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, I had my fallback plan was using New Zealand. Um, My parents had managed to get permanent residency for our family when I was quite young. It was a very long process and they've changed the rules since then. But um, at the time I did have permanent residency and that qualifies me for local rates um, at universities here in New Zealand. Mm-hmm. And the quality of education is just the same as New Zealand. Um, probably a little bit less name recognition, but mm-hmm. um, still good. So mm-hmm. I started looking at programs and I wasn't going to apply without 
telling my partner at the time, um, Patrick. And so I, I asked him if he if he wanted to come along. And so the plan was originally only to come here for a year for my program and then to go back home. Um, but we just liked it so much. And it was so different, such a breath of fresh air. Um, and we just we just really fell in love with New Zealand. Wow. So what's the weather like in New Zealand in comparison to Boston? Um, it's quite different. I'd say it can get quite frigid in Boston um, and obviously the snow. Um, there's not a whole lot of places that snow a lot in New Zealand. But if you imagine New Zealand, um, it's kind of like the same land area as uh, California. Okay. It's got the same population as about the entirety of Boston, the Boston and okay. plus the surrounding area, I'd say it's about 5 million population. Um, and the weather is just as varied as California. So like you can ski in California, but also you have the, beach the desert and the desert. Um, we don't have so much desert here in New Zealand, but um, it's very mountainous. It's an island. So there's a lot of beaches all the way around. Um, and there's some places that are, get quite cold. Um, I'd say probably the first experience that I'd say was like really shocking was just trying to find a place to live. Um, the cost of living was just way higher here than I had realized. Uh, Cause mm. the last time I was here, I was a kid. I wasn't <laughs> putting our <laughs> holiday bill or anything. Um, but food is actually quite considerably more here. Um, rent, depending on where you are, it can be quite, quite high. Um, and other things that you wouldn't imagine are quite significantly lower. For example, car insurance. Um, mm. So living in Boston, New Hampshire, our car insurance, we would easily pay, I would maybe pay like 300 a month, like depending on how nice of a car you have. Um, and then here, I think I just got my bill and it's 300 for the whole year mm. for my car. So it's wow. like crazy, crazy cheaper. Um, but then on the other hand, to pay for the um, like accidents and things that might happen on the road and road and, you know, to pay to keep the roads up to date here in New Zealand, um, they make gas prices a little bit higher. So gas mm. is high, but car insurance is low. So little things like that, you just take it for granted that oh, that's just the way things are in the United States. And then when you live mm. to another move to another country, you just see how people do things a little bit differently. Um, but I'd say, yeah, uh, definitely the, the rental, paying so much for it, and then the standard of housing being so poor here in New Zealand. Um, if you're extremely uh, wealthy, everything's fine. But if you're living in a um, not so well-to-do neighborhood, um, people are very used to not having insulation in their homes mm. um, and single paned windows. And it gets cold here, like you need it. Um, mm. and, uh, it's just crazy that they just, that's not a standard. It's not a standard here. So, so that was a very pivotal, pivotal, um, you know, realization for us. And that's mm -hmm. also what led us down the, the tiny house, um, movement line. Yeah. Mm, because it's the Allen. So I'm assuming that a lot of things are being imported in, yes. which drives the prices of things when you're on a, you know, on an Island. You know, i.e. Hawaii is an island and tell you the price out is always the price of milk. People, the first thing people tell me about when they when they, milk, you know, yes. the price of the milk is because, you know, there are no cows. On yeah. thing, so they, <laughs> they have to import it. So so I can see it being because I, you know, I, you know, when you look at the map, not the, your eye is not drawn to New Zealand. So I didn't mm. even realize that it was a island. Mm -hmm. So, so, I'm, so that's new to me as well. So I'm like, wow, that's very interesting because I can imagine prices being higher when you have to import many things from a boat, from yes. a ship. You yes, know? indeed. And there's just a lot less variety. You go into, I, I remember like, it blew my mind the last time I was in Texas. I was just like, I took, I'm embarrassed to say, I took a photo of the cereal aisle so I could remember when I moved back to New Zealand how much variety you guys yeah. have. Because yeah, here it's just like 
one little section and people mm-hmm. are like, wow, that's good enough. You know, <laughs> like mm-hmm. don't even mm-hmm. understand what you can get. Yeah, the same. it's a so whole different. side of, you know, oh, I, yeah. I go to Walmart, I look at the cereal aisle, which I don't go because if I do that, I'll be buying. I know you buy it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so I don't even look over there because it's a whole situation. And so um, so I don't even go to the dial, but you look down there and you say, God, that is a lot of cereal. And then they got the family size and the mega packs, you know. And, and I'm, the little tiny ones the and the little individual ones. <laughs> yes, and I, and I will always go there. And, I'm, and to me, I don't eat that kind of stuff in the middle, like in the morning. I will have one of those late night cravings and then I will start, you know, binging craving on the, it. Yeah. yeah, on cereal. I know it's just bad, you know. It's so bad for your teeth. It is so bad. It's it's not necessary, but it's mm-hmm. just you get used to the availability of things. Um, mm-hmm. Like my husband, he was just saying he went into the hardware store the other day. He needed he broke his tape measure. He needed a new tape measure. They're completely sold out. It was just boxes left on the shelf. So wow. even with this pandemic going on, plus inflation. Um, there's going to be a few gaps in, uh, in the supply chain and yeah. we're, at, we're at the end of the shipping line. So we're going to, we're wow. going to hear it. Wow. We're going to feel it. So you, you mean by end of the shipping line, mean that when they do ship things to New Zealand, it's like they're visiting other places first before they even get to you guys. Yeah. And a lot of ships don't even come down here anymore, honestly, because it's just, it's not a big enough of a market. You know, if you can sell 30 shipping containers of, I don't know, ice cream, um, you're going to take it to Australia because New Zealand's only going to buy 10, you know? So, mm. yeah. Wow. Didn't think of that either. Mm. Mm. So when you're minimalizing your life down to mm. get, you know, everything that you once had, I don't know how big your place was before you, you know, how much stuff you had accumulated. Yeah. But I know when I went from a house to a apartment and I was sharing it with a roommate, imagine you have your a house to yourself and then you decide to you know, try to cut down on costs. So you move with a roommate and now you have to minimize your house down to a two bedroom apartment, mm-hmm. which you now. So when I had a, you know, three you know, uh, bedroom house. <laughs> so, um, and so, I mean, I had to have um, a yard sale. I had to, whatever I didn't sell in the yard sale, I had to give to um, to Salvation Army. I gave to family members because I just couldn't take it with me. And I, def- I, def- I definitely wasn't going to create a new bill because this was all about trying to reduce cost to yeah. go and try to find a storage unit. So I had yeah. to, it, it all, it had to go. So uh, how did you, you know, in some you didn't have a lot, but still, I'm sure it is a adjustment to have to say, OK, we really have to think about our purchases before we buy things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Not because of Absolutely. price, but because of space. Space. <laughs> yes. <laughs> there are two considerations. Yeah, definitely. You want to keep your costs down, but you also like you just don't have room for it. When we were living in the tiny house, it was the rule pretty much was one thing in, one thing out. If I wanted to buy a new mm. coat, I had to get rid of something because uh, we only had so many hooks and you know, have so mm-hmm. many hangers. Um, so that was one one thing I had to get my head around. But it was actually really freeing. Which it's just it's just like any habit that you develop. Um, you just practice, and once you get it down, it's just really nice not even thinking like when you go into a store, you're not even like this doesn't apply to me. Everything, all like the decoration y stuff that you see at stores mm-hmm. and the paintings and the tchotchkes and the fake plants, it just didn't apply to me because I literally mm-hmm. just had no room. My house was designed and decorated as it is. And if I wanted to change something, everything would have to change. So I just didn't right. even want to go there. Um, mm-hmm. But when we first moved to New Zealand, that's when we got rid of the majority of our stuff. Um, luckily, I had only invested in like Ikea ish type of furniture. And so um, I didn't really have, it wasn't like a hard ship to get rid of that stuff because I didn't have any attachment to it at all. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, you know, just moving to New Zealand, you have two suitcases. That's all you can take on the plane. So Mm -hmm. we had to do a big reduction to move to New Zealand. And then when we moved into our flat, um, luckily it was furnished. So we didn't have to buy any furniture. We pretty much just kept what we had. I mean, we bought like kitchen accessories and things like that. Um, and then we moved into the tiny house. Um, we just took everything that we had from the flat. So it was mostly clothes, kitchen stuff. And we were just talking earlier about like cords and like electronics and stuff. And that was, that was really it. 
Um, so we were very fortunate. We didn't have to do like a huge purge in New Zealand. Um, mm-hmm. But it is people underestimate how long, first of all, how long it's going to take. They overestimate how much money they'll make. Cause mm-hmm. I'm sure you realize too, you're like, ah, oh, easily. I got like thousands of thousands of dollars worth of stuff. But if you're in a time crunch, you can't get that money out right away. You right. know, if you're trying to sell your furniture, your bedding or whatever. Um, so I think if you time, if time is of the essence, you just have to realize it's a lot of stuff you'll be giving away. And that's the most efficient, the yeah. most efficient way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I'll call it a two for one. Like, you know, I always get back to like when exercise, like, you know, when I exercise, I'm like, you know, at least DJ, it's the same activity to lose weight and remain healthy. Right. At least it's not two different yeah, activities to do that. And at least yeah. when it comes to saving money, in your situation, when it comes to minimalism, you can't buy a lot of stuff any longer. And also, because you can't buy a lot of stuff, there's no room for it, you save money. So it's like yes. you kill, you know, two birds with one stone, yes. um, you know, in that situation. So I, I like that idea. But when I, I, I finally, you know, that situation with my roommate um, ended, I, I moved, actually, I had rid of my house out and the family that I had moved into the house had moved out of the house. Mm-hmm. So I ended up moving back into my house house Mm -hmm. and um and i'm like i'll never ever uh accumulate that much crap ever again but ironically because you have more space now (laughs) you forget you know the rule because i was like i I was like i was like okay if i buy a new shirt about new you know uh, something new i will get rid of something else Mm -hmm. but then you're like i really don't want to get rid of that Okay, I'm just hold on to the, both of these, and then eventually you're like, oh my god, you know, how did I get this much stuff? <laughs> but again, you know, like, yeah, it's like, oh my god, you know, actually, I'm trying, I'm going through spring cleaning right now. Well, mm-hmm. winter, winter cleaning, and so, so ultimately, you guys, you know, spent five years in your tiny home, mm-hmm. and recently, you guys um, upgraded. Mm-hmm. To a larger home, and mm-hmm. is gr- and and tell me more about that that situation of migrating from um, mm-hmm. you know mission. I won't say mission accomplished, but obviously you guys felt some level of accomplishment to be mm-hmm. able to to move from a tiny home to a larger home, mortgage free. Yes, yes. So. Um, you know, living in the tiny house was always a means to an end. It wasn't ever going to be our forever home. And for some people, that's what they choose to do. You know, maybe you're retiring, maybe um, you want to permanently live on a boat and travel the world, like whatever your situation is, that's totally fine. But for us, we knew that it was a way for us to save a lot of money for a short amount of time. And that's why we were willing to make that sacrifice because people come and see our tiny house and they're like, how did you do that for five years? It's really, really small. Um, And how many square feet on the floor? Um, I don't know in square feet. It's uh, 14 square meters. So I think it's, it's less than 200. Oh, wow. So it's really, it's like a parking space. The daily Mm. mail did an article and they just kept saying like, they live in a place smaller than a parking lot, parking spot. I'm like, (laughs) why would you, but whatever. I guess that's how most people visualize space anyway. Um, so we um, had always known that we just wanted it to be temporary. So we were willing to make our sacrifice. But I, I, I agree with what you were saying earlier is humans are kind of like goldfish. You know, that story where the goldfish, when it's in a really small um, fish bowl will stay small. But if you mm. put the goldfish in a big pond, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger because oh. the pond is bigger. Um, mm. So I think humans kind of are the same way. It's like if you if you keep someone in a small space, that's it. That They fill the space and then they're comfortable. Um, if you put someone in a big space, they fill the big space. Um, and that's just human nature. <laughs> There's nothing mm. you can do about it. And we're mm. kind of finding that here. Um, but I think that's what we were cognizant of that fact and our tendencies and our, our human foibles. Um, mm-hmm. But we kept our house to a very small size too. So our house is only a two bedroom. Um, it's open plan. Our kitchen is very limited. Um, our living place doesn't have a lot of like, I didn't want too much space to store things. So I think the only thing we'll need to get is a few shelves on the wall. But other than that, um, it's pretty small. We've managed mm-hmm. to keep things pretty small. But, Cause um, I was watching your YouTube channel, 
Mm-hmm. Um, and I, you, you, in one of the videos, you actually gave us a tour of, of, the, yeah. of the home. Yeah. And your husband was showing things that he had built, and he showed the kitchen in, 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 in different places, and you was even showing the outside of the home. Mm-hmm. And, I, and, and he was saying that he did a lot of construction himself yes. on the home. And I, and, but I mean, the, the view is, oh my God, it's just, it's to die. <laughs> it's the for, best part. Yes. Yeah, yes. to wake up to that every single morning. And I saw that view. I said, maybe I need to get a home in New Zealand, you know? <laughs> um, it's a million dollar view. It really is. And you can't get, is. we, we look at, at that view every day and we're like, we would never be able to afford this in the States ever, ever, ever. Mm-hmm. So, it, it's and if you want something like that, you might have to you know make sacrifices, look elsewhere, um, to try to get it. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, you you have to. I think your priorities are are if that's your priority that I want that view. I want to wake up to that every single morning, and I may have to pay more gas money for that, or pay more in milk for that. Then yeah. You 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 were like okay well fine I, and to me I would be you know I'm not a big milk drinker no anyway so <laughs> so Neither you know I. and I'm working from home mostly so it's like okay well maybe that's you know that's something that I I, I wouldn't I would definitely be willing to try it out you know and like you, like you have your that tiny home mm-hmm. on listed on Airbnb so mm-hmm. people can experience that and see if yes. they they would enjoy it or like it so I, I like exactly. that idea yeah we never had that opportunity we had never stepped foot in a tiny house before we built ours and we designed it ourselves um and we had watched a lot of youtube videos and um you know, there's t- there were tons of articles and, you know, that TV show had just come out, uh, Tiny House Station. So that was where we got our inspiration from. But yeah, mm. it's 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 a big choice. It's a big decision. And so taking the time to like really investigate it, that is um, that's a really good way to make sure that you um, that you know what you're doing and that you know what you're signing up for. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. So I wanted to definitely ask you um you know, I, I, I'm pretty much I'm asking the question, but I already sort of kind of understand the answer. Mm-hmm. But I want to bring it back to your book. So why did you decide to write your latest book, South Island Tiny House, which is available on Amazon.com? Yes, it is. Um, well, I, I had always kind of in the back of my head had the idea to write a book, um, especially about the tiny house, because I knew it was such an important time in our lives um, such a unique story that we had moving from the States to New Zealand and building a tiny house. I just wanted to get it down on paper in one place. Um, when we started building, we I had kept a blog. Um, I wasn't very good at it. <laughs> mm. um, and we kind of like let it fall to the wayside by the end of it because we were in a serious time crunch. Our lease was up in our flat and um, we needed to finish our build. So I was like, that's not a priority. Finishing the tiny house is a priority. Um, And then we started the YouTube channel um, pretty much during like lockdown of 2020 that we had in New Zealand. Um, And I was like, okay, I have two too much information all over the place. I got my blog. I've got YouTube. I've got you know, all the information that I have up in my head, all the stories that we've gone through. And um, I had been working on it here and there for a good couple of years before I actually just told myself, I'm like, you know what, Corey, life is too short. Um, Mm -hmm. You want, if you're going to leave something behind, leave this story behind, because I mean, I lost my grandmother um, in September of 2020. And Mm -hmm. what I wouldn't give to read a book by my grandmother Um, It's just something that you just want to hold on to your loved ones. And it's so much more permanent. I mean, you can leave all the TikToks you want behind, but (laughs) it's not like, it's not like that's a very permanent thing that someone can just sit down and really connect with that person. um, Right. Who knows? By the time you have grandchildren and they're causing it, they see the the value and importance Mm -hmm. of it. TikTok may not even be around. I know. You, know. you don't know. You don't know. Books right. are eternal. So, yes. <laughs> so I told myself that that was going to be my goal. Um, after my grandmother passed, I really just put everything in high gear. I'm like, life is way too short. And I, 
I feel like I let her down by not doing it earlier that she couldn't be proud of me for that. Mm -hmm. So um, I quit my job in May of 2020. Yeah. Uh, 2021. Sorry. And, um, and then we started our business. I wrote my book um, and I'm really proud of it. It's not very long, um, but it is really informative. I worked really hard on it and I, um, I just, I just like having like the physical. Yes, it's nothing <laughs> the like physical copy of it. Yes, it's nothing like holding it in your hands. So exactly, and to me, when I finally finished my my book, I it was it was you know it was bittersweet because I'm like oh, I'm so I'm so tired because <laughs> it was it was so much work trying to get it done, and then I yes. finally got it done. I had the hard copy, and I wish I would have took more time to just you know sit down and breathe it in and take it in and appreciate it. But I was mm-hmm. like, okay, now it's time to do this and do that and do this and do that. But now, you know, it's been, um, I think, about two years since I, I published it. And I'm just like, I can look at it now and go, oh, you know, this is just so great to have, you know, something um, tangible in yes. your hands that you written. And it always feels good when someone says, oh, yeah, I read this in, this story in your book. And mm-hmm. and it really, uh, I really enjoyed it. Or cause My brother, he actually had read my book and he had actually, you know, had, called me and said and he started talking about one of the stories that I put in the book that he remembered mm-hmm. and I always thought it was so funny and I just I, and he had he explained it it was so different than the way that I interpreted it you know he mm-hmm. interpreted it very different because he you know we had the same memory the same story but he had a different yeah interpretation of the of the events and I said oh wow <laughs> you know so it's, it's definitely something that I think is to cherish and um and I think that uh if you want to leave something behind for for uh anyone after you I think a book is the way to do it I agree yeah it's just such a great form of communication and you, you most people think of a book as a one directional kind of kind of way of communicating, but it really mm-hmm. is. It opens so many conversations. Um, I mean, I've been on so many podcasts, talked to so many people about it. Mm-hmm. And um, it's just been, it's just opened so many doors. Um, and, it, you know, some people call it vanity publishing, but all publishing is vanity. Yeah, <laughs> so it is. Just, I think you got to like, have some level of ego to, to, to write a book. And, um, but, you know, I think that, when you write a book, there has to be something within you that just wants to leave something behind, you yes. know. And yeah. I think that it's really spiritual because I think that um, you have read a book where you want, oh, thank God this person wrote this book. And, and they probably are dead and gone. But they wrote that book not knowing who was going to read it, who was going to inspire. And to me, that was the biggest inspiration for me, that someone wrote a book. They didn't know how, how well it was going to do. It may not even get the level of success where it didn't get the level of the book that I I, I, I love the most. The mm-hmm. author didn't never expect it to, to be as popular because he never knew mm-hmm. the Internet, whatever it is. He wrote, this book was written in 1915, I think, 1904. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so he didn't know anything about the Internet or anything. But you, can, you put this person's name in. It's called you know, William Walker Atkinson. Mm-hmm. And you will see hundreds upon thousands of websites mm-hmm. uh, you know, to find his book, which is in the, mm-hmm. it's in the public domain. And I thought, wow, that's so great that I had to pull myself away from it that, you know, stop thinking about how successful you want it to be and you want it, you know, to sell this many copies. You're like, you don't know what your book will become, become, you know, it may far go far beyond your ever imagination, mm-hmm. but are you willing to accept that, that you may never see the benefit or the, or the, or the, the value that your book may have, you know, mm-hmm. long after you're gone? Absolutely. And that's just, that's, that's a risk. That's a trust. And that's a, it's almost like, you know, like they say your book is your baby, but when you let your baby out into the world, you have zero control over what happens and artists and writers. And that's just a a part of the journey that you just have to accept. Um, Mm, And so, yeah, yeah, I'm really glad that I, I took those steps and that and that I did that for me. And um, I'm sure a lot of people can resonate with that as you know, the pandemic really just um, put a lot of things in perspective and Mm -hmm. made those life goals, you know, like in the future, I'll do that, yada, yada. But it's like, well, you don't know if the future is going to be around. 
So you better right. do it while you can. Um, while you here. have that idea, while you have that, that spark. Yeah, so yeah that. I like that. How has forgiveness affected your life? Because this one of the one of the subjects that have come up in every single discussion that I've had with every author during this month of February has been forgiveness. Who, um, for you, was the hardest person or experience that you had to forgive? Um, I probably have to say my father. Um, but it was, uh, it, my, he's, he's just been such a huge, supportive, loving, amazing parent. Um, whatever I wanted to do as a child, I was hundred percent backed up hundred percent, um, had his faith and belief, um, except for when I told him I was moving to New Zealand with my white boyfriend. Mm. Um, he sent me a letter. Uh, he's has amazing penmanship. And so when I, 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 I'm always so excited to get his letters or his cards in the mail. Um, and he's pretty old school like that. So he didn't call mm. me, he didn't send me an email. He wrote me a letter to tell me that this was a horrible idea. <laughs> oh, wow. And that absolutely broke my heart. And I know he was doing it from a, p- a place of love, from a place of worry, um, from a place of concern, because this was his, I guess I was 23 at the time. I was quite still quite young. Um, first boyfriend uh, and first like serious relationship. And I was planning on moving to a whole nother country with this person that we weren't like, we weren't married at the time. We didn't share any assets or anything. Um, so it, it wasn't about me waiting for him to be like, oh, I'm sorry. I made a horrible mistake because obviously it turned out just fine. Um, Mm -hmm. it was more, I needed to forgive him because it wasn't, it wasn't about me. Like, even though the letter was addressed to me, Mm -hmm. it wasn't about me. It wasn't my, (laughs) it wasn't my projection. Exactly. Um, so that was probably the biggest the biggest thing of forgiveness I had to do is that mm-hmm. um, you re- like you have to be so steadfast in your own belief that what you're mm-hmm. doing is right for your own life, mm-hmm. even if it doesn't work out, even if people laugh at you, even if people are mm-hmm. shocked at the choices that you choose to make, um, and even if the people that you that unexpectedly um, don't support you, because mm-hmm. at the end of the day. <laughs> you're born alone, you die alone and Mm. you should be number one in your life. And you need to make yourself happy by making those choices that you know, that are right for you. Um, Mm. and getting caught up in, Oh, he owes me an apology or she owes me yada, yada. Nobody owes you anything. Mm -hmm. Um, and so being able to, um, reconcile that inside of yourself, um, forgive the others that have, brought hurt and pain upon you Mm -hmm. um, because life is just too short to marinate in that. And you, you you don't want that negativity in your life. Believe me. Um, It took me a long time to, to feel, to feel okay about that, that moment Mm -hmm. to forgive my father for, for what he said. Did you address Um, it? Did you have a conversation with him about it or? That is not the way of my family. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, it's it's about you. It's not it's not about yeah. Anything. Forgiveness is not about anyone, but for yourself, and um, and that's something that you know. And to me, that's you know, question I've been asking myself over the last few weeks is, who do I need to forgive? Mm. Because what everyone has said to me every single time is, once they were able to forgive a person, the person they need to forgive. Mm. That's when the, a piece of the, a piece of their life opened up mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. when they when they forget like some blockages that they was experiencing seemed like they were not blockages any longer. Yeah, and I thought, ooh, <laughs> let, me, let me get my list together. <laughs> <laughs> let me look for what I need to do. Um, right, 
It is freeing. Yeah, it's it really freeing. is. Yes, it is. Yeah. Yes, it is. So uh, we mentioned that we can get your book on Amazon.com, The South Allen Tiny House. Mm-hmm. Is there anything? And also your YouTube channel. Um, and I'll have those links down in the show description. So you're not trying to remember all this. <laughs> have you ever seen <laughs> some of the links to YouTube channel? Like, uh, I'm going to never remember that. I but I have those in, in, the, in the show description. Mm-hmm. So also I will include the link to uh, if you want it to you know visit New Zealand or if you're already in, already in New Zealand and you wanted to stay at a tiny house to experience it for yourself mm-hmm. I have the link down in the show description so you can also sign up for that I, if I ever want to take a trip to New Zealand guess where I'm going <laughs> <laughs> No worries on the house. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate that. You know, because that view, I I'm telling you guys, you got to visit her her uh, her YouTube channel to see that view that she wakes up to every single morning. You will be blown away, and to understand that, you know, again, like like you like um, Corey said. If you wanted that view here in America, you're going to pay for that view. Oh, yeah. You know. For sure. For sure. So, yeah. So it's, I, I think it, it's a quality of life thing. I, I can. Def- I saw that and I said, oh, she has a wonderful quality of life. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> I am very fortunate, but it took a lot of sacrifice, but I'm very fortunate we got to the end. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, to me, the end and the beginning at the same time. Right. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Well, thank you for joining me, and I want to definitely stay in contact with you and, and learn more about your story as you progress. I will continue watching you on YouTube. Thank you, and, DJ. Um, <laughs> and continue looking at your books because this is, I think, your fourth, fourth, fifth, fourth or fifth book. Um, well, I, if you color, if you consider coloring books, books. <laughs> okay. It's like the fourth one, I think. Fourth one. Okay. 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 Cool. Yeah. All right. Thank you. <laughs> All, right. All right. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye.